What's wrong with Germany? In a country not known for disruptive politics, a regional election has set off a political earthquake that is shaking Angela Merkel's Christian Democratic Party to its foundations. The crisis erupted when the party's local branch in the eastern German state of Thuringia voted side by side with the far-right AFD party to anoint a political outsider as state premier. That broke a long-standing taboo on cooperation with right-wing populists and provoked massive protest within and beyond the CDU. Merkel's designated successor and party leader Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer stepped down. The power struggle to succeed her is now in full swing. Our topic today, fiasco in Thuringia. Will the AFD destroy Merkel's legacy? Thanks for joining us on To The Point, and welcome to our guests. Matthew Karnitschig is chief correspondent for the U.S. magazine Politico. He believes the AFD hasn't destroyed Merkel's legacy. The AFD is Merkel's legacy. What happened in Thuringia offers a glimpse of the chaos that lies ahead for Germany's political system. And great to have Derek Scully with us. He is correspondent for the Irish Times, and he says... German politics has finally entered the 21st century, but its politicians are too naive or scared to notice. And a, a welcome to Wendelina von Bredo. She writes for The Economist, and she believes fragmenting politics and strong extremes are upending Germany's traditional parties, with the Social Democrats in even worse shape than Merkel's CDU. So, Derek, I think actually many people have the impression that German politics are staged to the point of perhaps dullness. But you say they are now finally entering the 21st century. What does that mean? It means we have started the reality of fragmentation happening elsewhere in Europe that never really happened in Germany. Germany was solid, like a sensible pair of shoes, not very glamorous, but, you know, you can go <laughs> yeah. a long way in it. I mean, next thing we'll be having a sex scandal. You know, Germany is very state politics, but maybe everything's possible at this stage. Wendelina, you refer to fragmentation and strong extremes. Germany's weekly Die Zeit says that the party system is now more unstable than it ever has been before. Would you agree with that and what are the implications? Well, I guess not since the Weimar Republic. That, that was a time of great instability. But I would agree with the assessment of the Zeit. And I, I think there's great uncertainty about what the future will bring, given the fact that the two big traditional parties, what they call here the People's Parties, the Volkspartei, seem to be in decline. The SPD is in even worse shape. The Social Democrats are even in worse shape than the Christian Democrats. And Matthew, somebody looking from outside Germany at all of this could be forgiven for saying, OK, so the Christian Democrats in a small eastern state vote side by side with the AFD party. What's the big deal? Doesn't democracy often create rather unusual and uncomfortable bedfellows? Absolutely, and I think that's why it's difficult for a lot of people outside Germany to understand the uproar that this has caused and that it's led to these resignations and all of this soul-searching. And it, it really shows how, how deep the wounds of the Second World War really remain here. And when people you know, refer to Weimar, which obviously was, you know, this period that led to, to Hitler's rise, it really strikes a chord with people. And I think, you know, Germans would, would do well maybe to stand back and to, to listen to people outside the country a bit and, and look to other systems and see that this is perfectly normal to have multiple parties in a parliament. If you look at the Netherlands, they have, I think, 12 parties or something like that in their parliament. Uh, you don't have to go to that extreme. But Germany has for so long had this very cozy system of just a few parties dominating their politics. And as Derek says, now they're really moving into the, the 20th century. And I think for a long time they felt that this threshold that they have of 5%, any party needs to get 5% in order to get into parliament, that that would shield them from this kind of fragmentation. And that has turned out not to be the case. Absolutely. In fact, that was decided uh, post-World War II, partly because of the Weimar Republic and the fragmentation that occurred at that time. So to see why this event in Thuringia has sent shockwaves all the way to Berlin, let us take a closer look at what happened in Thuringia. Point. 
it was a scandal. Even though his party got the fewest votes, Thomas Kemmerich was surprisingly elected state premier of Thuringia. He secured the position with votes from the CDU and AFD. For the first time in German post-war history, right-wing populists played the kingmakers. According to a court ruling, AFD leader Björn Höcke may now be legally called a fascist. Many saw Kemmerich's handshake with him as a taboo breaker. A gesture from this left party politician has become a symbol of protest. Even Chancellor Merkel, who was on a state visit to South Africa, spoke out. This course of action was unforgivable, and so the results must be reversed. But even the new Premier's resignation couldn't calm the storm. Democratic election or taboo breaker? What message has Thuringia sent? Wendelin, it, it is unclear to this day to what degree the Christian Democrats in Thuringia actually overtly coordinated with the AFD on that third round of voting that occurred. Nonetheless, the reaction from Berlin was absolutely immediate and very, very negative, as we have seen. So why? What is behind this taboo on even indirect coordination with the AFD? I think that Merkel and, and the leadership of the party decided we cannot work with the AFD. They are extremists. We cannot, we don't want to, and that would be the start of the decline of the CDU. And of course, if you break that consensus, if you start chipping away at the consensus, then, then it just doesn't work anymore. So that's why I think the reaction was also so strong. I said, impossible, we have to reverse that particular development. Yet, yeah, Derek, it looks like not everybody within the Christian Democratic Party necessarily subscribes to this uh, taboo. The fact is that the local party leader there in Thuringia, he was told beforehand by Annegret kram karrenbauer don't do this. He went ahead, did it anyway, and when she castigated him afterward, uh, he didn't take orders. Exactly. So he is still in his job. Uh, he said he would resign, but he hasn't. She has lost her job because she had no authority. She couldn't impose this on these local parties because Germany is such a big country. Every federal state, 16 of them, they all have their individual character. And for obviously for these people in Thuringia, they felt doing a deal covertly or non-covertly with the AFD and to get a left-wing premier out of the state, out of power in the state, was the lesser of two evils for them. Um, having a left-wing government was uh, unacceptable and apparently the AFD for them was acceptable and that really says a lot about German politics that actually while Berlin and Merkel is sort of the, the brand name in particularly in Eastern Germany you know they're a lot more conservative and they feel that the conservative side of their party has been neglected and this was their sort of howl of protest that if we continue to neglect the conservatives they're going to go over to the AFD and we we're going to have to do a deal with them anyway so they they are saying that the people in Berlin are the people in denial. Matthew, interestingly enough, back in the 1930s, Thuringia was the first of the German states in which a Nazi minister was allowed uh, into the local government. That comparison has been made frequently since the events that we're talking about mm. in Thuringia. Are comparisons between the current taboo and that event in the 30s fair and appropriate in this setting, or do they perhaps create more alarm than uh, is justified? Well, you know, John McCain liked to say that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but, but it rhymes. And I, I've thought about that uh, quote often, you know, with these, with these comparisons. Um, you know, the Nazis aren't in, in power there, the fascists, as the German media is now now calling the, the AFD uh, chapter in Thuringia. Um, you know, th this, this was, you know, by several degrees of separation, actually, that they were supporting, that they were somehow collaborating with the conservatives, with Merkel's conservatives, to uh, make this guy this, the state premier. So it's a little bit different, I think, than what happened in the 1930s. I think it's also important to remember here that the the facts on the ground in Thuringia and in other Eastern uh, German states are such that it has become very difficult to form any kind of coalition if you are blocking out the two political extremes. 
Uh, it's important to remember that in Thuringia, the, the uh, top party, the party who placed first, was the left party, which some people see as an extreme left party. That was which, actually the successor to the East German Communist Party. To the, communist to the East German uh, Communist the Party, the, the SED. And, and Merkel's party, many in her party, most party in, in the party, refused to cooperate with, with them as well. So they're ruling out two parties that collectively got uh, about 50%, 50 percent, 50 plus percent of the vote. And, you know, but again, this is this is an East German phenomenon. If you look at where the AFD is in the Western German states and Northern German states in particular, they're in the mid single digits. So I think there's a, too much Whereas hysteria. Here they had uh, what was their percentage? I think the they were 23, 20, 23, 24. 20, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think the Linke got 20, 28, 29. Um, you know, right. so, so there is a shift in, in the East mm -hmm. towards the AFD. Uh, we've seen that over the past several uh, regional elections. And, you know, that's the real story. This is the problem. And I think this is what happened in Thuringia last week is the inevitable result of the fact that a quarter of the population in East Germany is voting for a far-right party. And in uh, Vendelina, in this particular case, the AFD in Thuringia is in fact quite rabidly right wing, is it not? Yes, so it's one of the more radical um, chapters of the AFD. And in particular, Björn Höcke, who we see on the picture, is a um, is very controversial and one of the most radical leaders of the party. So that's, I think, Remind why people... Remind us what that means, uh, being radically right-wing. What Can you just quote a few things that he said or his positions? Um, I don't remember exact quotes, but he would certainly say things that are absolutely not politically correct and that make light of the Nazi regime. And that's for many absolutely taboo to, to even think about working with he such said a man. Germany needs a 180-degree turn in the way it deals with commemorating or recognizing what happened in the Holocaust. So it has a guilt cult that is disgraceful. He called the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin a, um, a memorial of disgrace. Um, so, yeah, he's basically saying Germany needs to get over itself. It's sort of, um, it needs to stop chastising itself and look forward to a bright tomorrow. One of his party allies also said, um, you know, Germ the Nazi period, the 12 years Nazi period was like bird shit compared to all the glories of German history. Um, so he's driving it. Uh, he's driving the, the radicalization of the party so that of all places it for it to happen here shows that, you know, he's very much in the driving seat. But I would say all he's did was just sort of stir the pot. I mean, he, with very little effort, they've just managed to completely disrupt the German political system. They've lost the leader of the largest party is gone. And they're just sitting back. They've had to do nothing since Wednesday of last week. So for me, I would agree with Matthew, it's just shown how fragile it all was. The facade looked great, but German politics, and in the, under the late Merkel era, has been a Potemkin village, a, a strong wind and the facades fall down. So let's find out why Matthew's opening statement said that the AFD is Merkel's legacy. Well, I, I think it's her legacy because it didn't really exist in its current form before 2015. In the summer of 2015, the AFD was polling in, in the low single digits. It had, it had peaked, and some might remember that the, the party started as an anti-Euro party. It did very well during the, the Greek crisis by arguing that Germany uh, should not be, be paying for these uh, bailouts and so forth. And it wasn't until the refugee crisis and, and Merkel agreed to uh, leave Germany's uh, borders open and accept um, over a million refugees that the party really took off. So and I, I, I think there is something to this criticism that she made decisions there against really the, the will of the base of her party. And the AFD immediately took advantage of that. They switched their message away from the euro to a more, what you could call a sort of classic far-right uh, message, which is anti-immigrant, anti -immigrant, which is <clears throat> what the issue that all of the populists in Europe have really thrived on. And all of a sudden, they took off and, you know, have been polling between sort of 12 and 15 percent ever since. And in, in East uh, Germany, uh, which is particularly particularly fertile ground uh, for anti-immigrant sentiment for various reasons, they've, they've done particularly well. So, Vendelina, um, one of the arguments made by that local branch in Thuringia of the Chancellor's Party, the Christian Democrats, was that keeping the AFD at arm's length or refusing in any way to deal with them actually makes them stronger than weaker. Do you think that's right? 
There might be a point uh, to it in the sense that ostracizing a party that gets so many votes, you know, might might actually boost them. And of course, the recent episode has certainly given them a boost. I wanted to basically um, just comment uh, uh, on Matthew's view. I find it maybe a little bit harsh to say that the AfD is Merkel's legacy, just given the fact that in many other European countries, you now have a right-wing party on the ascendant and they didn't have Merkel in power. So I think in a way, the AfD is also part of the general trend in Europe and even in the United States. Although in, in, in those countries, the, these far-right parties have been around for quite some time. I mean, in Austria, for example, the, the, the Freedom Party has been around since the 1950s. In France, obviously, the Front National. I mean, there's an ebb and flow to these things. But in Germany, this type of party, when this kind of you know potent anti-immigrant message hadn't really existed before the refugee so, crisis. So let us... Uh, come back to the question of what all this means for Berlin. And to do that, I'd like to take a look at the damage that those shock waves from Thuringia have wreaked here in the capital. Annegret kramp karrenbauer intended as Merkel's successor, is resigning as party chief after 14 months in the position. It was a surprising move, but kramp karrenbauer has long been a controversial figure in her party, where she's widely seen as lacking the strength to lead. Kramp Karrenbauer's exit is also a defeat for Merkel, who took a gamble on AKK. It seems the era of women in the CDU may have passed. Now, three men are vying for the top party post, Jens Spahn, Armin Laschet and Friedrich Merz. The future configuration of the party also depends on these candidates. Will the party move to the middle or slide further to the right? The challenges are huge. Debates about the direction of the party, power struggles and sinking poll numbers. Is the CDU facing a major crisis? So Derek, how would you answer that question? How much damage has this done to the party here in Berlin? Well, it's just kind of ripped away this sort of nice facade that Merkel has had, had put on the party. She had a centrist party, everything was fine. As long as she was winning elections, the CDU didn't really think about who are we, what is our politics, who are we appealing to? Who are we neglecting? And all of that has just come crashing out into the open with this. Merkel hasn't even left yet. I mean, the CDU doesn't know what it is. And they're in this classic dilemma. They say, we're not allowed, you know, we need, we, 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 we need a new leader, but let's not get obsessed with personality contests. Let's talk about content. And when people like in, in Turing or in Eastern Germany, they say, well, let's talk about content. How far right is still acceptable? How, you know, can we pull back in voters, AFD people? We've lost AFD with a bit more hard right conservative politics. Then they say, no, no, that's a taboo. We're not allowed to do that. Let's go back to the leadership contest. So they're going around and around in circles and they've just have forgotten you need to pitch policy to various voter groups. And of course, the other parts will protest and say that's too extreme. But if it's back in the 1990s and 2000s, they had people in the party who were literally just the attack dogs. They'd send them out to send the right messages, hard conservative policies. Merkel sort of got rid of all of them. So she sort of put a lot of fabric conditioner into the machine and the CDU is nice and soft, but some people <laughs> like a towel with a bit of a scratch to it. And some conservatives like a bit of politics that will irritate the left. And Merkel really hasn't been doing that. And those people People have disappointed, have turned away, gone to the AFD, and some of the right of the AFD said they're not lost yet. With the right tone, the right signal, we can bring them back in. Otherwise, we're just going to have to work with the AFD, and we prefer to pull back their voters instead. So, um, Matthew, looking at that report uh, and Anna Great Trump, Karen Bauer, would you say that Thuringia is really the problem here, or was she the wrong successor and wrong party leader from the start? <clears throat> I think she was clearly the wrong person from the start. She was Merkel's you know, protege, more or less, and I think it became very clear um, early on in her tenure as party leader that she was out of her depth. And she made one gaffe after another. She didn't seem to really have the authority with the uh, within the party leadership that one would expect. And the reason for that, to be fair, is, is what she pointed to when she resigned, which was that it was very difficult to be party leader when somebody else is chancellor, especially somebody with this kind of aura and authority that that Angela Merkel has. And it was quite interesting a couple of, of days ago to see the reaction to what Kram Karrenbauer said about Thuringia. And uh, people basically ignored uh, her her statements. Even, even the German press didn't really give it as much attention as one might have expected, where she called for a new election and said that this was unacceptable. But then when Angela Merkel came out during a, a trip to Africa... We saw that and, in the opening. Uh... ...gave this, this very dramatic statement saying it was unforgivable all of the focus was 
on her and 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 on what what Merkel had said, and uh, that further diminished uh, Kram Kahnbauer's position. So Kram Kahnbauer is now still the head of the party, and she has a plan for where things go from here. And I'd like all of us, in a fairly limited amount of time, to talk a little bit about that plan and what it means for the stability of this country, uh, because we're talking about a chancellor who's been in power now for um, for a very, very long time. So two aspects to the plan, timetable mm -hmm. and a reunification of the positions of party leader with chancellor candidate or chancellor. So just tell us a little bit, Vendelina, about the workability of this plan. Well, she wants to be in charge until the summer and sort of oversee this transition period. And then, as you said, unify the two positions. Now there are four men really waiting in the wings to, to replace her. One is Jens Spahn, the youthful health minister, Marco Söder in Bavaria, Armin Laschet in North Rhine-Westphalia. Laschet kind of like a middle of the road uh, person, more along Merkel's lines, right? Exactly. And hang on, the fourth one would be... Friedrich Merz. Friedrich Merz, of course. Through exactly. He was ring yesterday, said. didn't he? Absolutely. Um, now, Friedrich Merz, of course, was beaten by AKK before, and uh, quite narrowly, but still. So he could make a comeback. But so the, uh, all the others are there, all strong candidates. Now, people think it's not a very workable plan because it's too slow and there will be too much um, uncertainty until the summer. And you already see internationally this uncertainty in German politics is not very popular and the euro is quite weak at the moment. So the markets don't like it. And I wonder whether a quicker, more neater solution wouldn't have been better at this stage to just really move on to the next stage and not wait a little more. Let me just ask you one thing, because an operative word in what you said was men have thrown their hats into the <clears> ring. Um, Many people are saying this Goethe Demerung yeah. of the CDU is also a Frauendämmerung, that it's the decline of the role of women leaders in the party. Do you think that's right? I think there is something to it. There's now a trend. And now Merkel has been in charge for a long time. And in some ways, it's maybe natural that it's now a man's turn or, or, or you know, then it's, I don't think it's the end of a powerful women in the CDU party, but certainly there'll be a pause now. So, Derek, what will this phase of reconfiguration mean for the stability of one of Europe's most important players? Germany is set to take over the rotating EU Council presidency in the second half of this year. Is it going to be utterly in disarray? Yeah, I mean, it reminds me, if I can't decide if Germany is like a car up on the blocks and people are trying to tinkering with it and it can't be fixed, or is it like one of those hell, you know, hellish flat shares where you've got these roommates who endlessly discuss things and nobody wants to decide anything? I mean, this government, the current government, took six months to put together. Uh, Merkel had a crisis in 2018 and she handed over power. That was two months gone. The SPD, their grand coalition partner, were out of action for the second half of last year. They've just got new leaders and 10 weeks later, um, the CDU is lacking somebody again. So literally for, for about more than half of the two years they've been in power, this government has just been navel-gazing. And I really am staggered by their ability to just completely ignore that the world, the EU, it cannot work without Germany, and Germany isn't working at the moment. So this notion of talking till the summer and actually voting at the end of the year is just ridiculous. And they just need a slap and be told, would you just get this sorted? But they're in denial about how deep the crisis is. They really just think they can rearrange the deck chairs. I don't think the CDU leadership actually realised this is a structural issue. Merkel was covering up for at least half of her, her time in power. She's been covering up this uh, dilemma. What is the CDU? How many streams, how many groupings can it hold together um, or will there be a split and I think they're still in denial about that. And of course all this at the moment when Germany will take over the EU presidency soon and, and as Derek says the, France is looking to Germany they want strong leadership they want and not an inward looking Germany in particular all this after Brexit so it's just everything at the wrong moment. So Matthew coming back to our title and whether all of this could destroy Merkel's legacy if we look at the potential uh, successors to her of the four two of them are quite conservative would they take the party and possibly the country back toward something very different from where Merkel has taken it? I think so, and, and that's my personal expectation, is that whoever wins this coming leadership contest will be a more conservative figure. And I think that the debate within the party will be, well, we went with the more moderate, we went with Kram Karrenbauer after Merkel, that didn't really work, now it's our 
turn of, you know, the true conservatives to field our own candidate. I'm not convinced that the CDU talking about stability of Germany itself, I'm not convinced that the CDU will uh, place first in the coming election. It'll be interesting in the coming weeks to see how this affects their poll ratings. I suspect that it won't help them. The Greens are doing very well. And coming back to your question about women in politics, there's still a chance that the next chancellor could be a woman because the co-leader of the Greens is a woman and might be their candidate for chancellor. So I think everything is sort of up in the air here at the moment. Just very, very briefly, if you would, if one of those very conservative uh, candidates were to become the new party leader, would Angela Merkel really serve out her term or would we see so. new elections? I think she would be gone. And maybe not new elections right away, but I think that she would step down as chancellor before the end of the legislative term, which runs until 2021. So a lot hanging in the balance for Germany. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us. And thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon.